turning something on or turning something off. So, yes, you increase chemicals, but that causes all kinds of other accommodations and regulation. So that's the mechanism here. And we also have a little bit of a sodium channel blocker mechanism stuck on there, which is something we often associate with anti-epileptics, anti-convulsant medications, but we know also has effects for mood because drugs that do that, such as we talked about Lamotrigine, but also our old friend carbamazepine, those drugs have been shown to be mood stabilizers or beneficial in mood states. Next, we have the dizipramine class includes macrotoline, which is an interesting drug. And these guys are more of norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. They have less serotonin reuptake inhibiting. And then they have the same other complex of other receptor activities and actions. And then over to the far right, we have amitriptyline, amoxapine, which has some atypical antipsychotic kind of properties. Uh, we have clomipramine, our old friend. Doxepin, which I was in here uh, last night listening to Dr. Grossberg talking about the low-dose doxepin for insomnia. And then nortriptyline, which is a little less of the serotonin activity. But here we have now a couple of new, different mechanisms, if you will, that are tacked on that we didn't used to fully understand either. So we have now two serotonin receptors that these drugs block, basically. They're antagonists. So we have 5-HT2A. Does anybody recognize our old friend 5-HT2A? What other class of medications do we think about? Atypical antipsychotics, right. And that is actually thought to be an antidepressant mechanism or augmenting mechanism. Think about we use atypical antipsychotics to augment, especially SSRIs. Part of what you're adding is that. Also, 5-HT2C antagonism which also can be seen with some of the atypical antipsychotics, such as olanzapine has that, and um, zeprazidone. We think that may be an antidepressant kind of mechanism as well. So when my professor, John Buckman, was saying, ah, dirty drugs are better, or the tricyclics, I, see, I seem to feel like they're more potent. He may be right if you look at these mechanisms of action. And then again, we have those other receptors, muscarinic cholinergic, alpha, one adrenergic, those are norepinephrine receptors. We have alpha and beta norepinephrine. The alphas are really prominent in the brain. And then the sodium channel block. So I encourage you to not forget about these drugs for your inadequate responders because what you're getting here is almost built-in augmentation, aren't you? You're getting many different methods. You're getting John Buckman's dirty drugs. Ah, dirty drugs are better. And that's what he was talking about. Okay, now, what are some tips on using tricyclics? Well, first of all, one of the nice features is that you can actually monitor blood levels. And when you do that, what, what are you going to find? You're going to find some people are faster or slower metabolizers. So you're going to find that some people that you're giving what you think is a therapeutic dose actually don't have a therapeutic blood level. That's very important for treating these patients. You're gonna find some people maybe who are gonna be less tolerant and are gonna have very high blood levels at lower doses. Especially the ones listed here, you can monitor. Okay. Most tricyclics are cytochrome P452D6 substrates. So that means, of course, that's a very common enzyme in the liver for metabolizing drugs, but it can also be inhibited or induced by a lot of medications. So you have to especially lower the dose if you're using inhibitors <laughs> of 2D6 or in patients who are poor metabolizers. And in the exhibit hall, you'll notice there's a vendor here that is offering genetic tests to help look at them. So genetic testing has not panned out as well as we would like for determining efficacy. In other words, it hasn't been as powerful to say, well, this drug is going to be the most efficacious for you or effective for you, but it has been very useful clinically in helping you with dosing and with metabolism of drugs, I would say. Lower the dose of being used, as I mentioned, with inhibitors. Believe it or not, fluoxetine and paroxetine are in that class. So if you're using a tricyclic as an augmentation strategy, you'd want to be careful about that. And then the tertiary tricyclics are metabolized to secondary tricyclics, 
by cytochrome P450 1A2. Does anybody know the relevance of 1A2? What is something that patients can do that can turn that on, induce 1A2? Smoking, exactly. And so that's a very important thing to realize, that smoking can in induce this enzyme and can enhance the conversion from a tertiary to a secondary. So for instance, amitriptyline goes to nortriptyline, imipramine goes to desipramine, and you'll get more nortriptyline or more desipramine if this patient's a smoker. Clomipramine goes to his metabolism. Also, fluvoxamine, which is an SSRI, is an inhibitor. So now you have that issue going on if you're augmenting with fluvoxamine with a tricycle. Okay, and you have uh, these slides, by the way, in your handouts, so time is an issue. I may go a little fast, but they should be there for you. Now, you can certainly use some of the tricyclics, the very serotonergic ones, and the classic one that is actually approved for this is clomipramine for OCD. <coughs> you can also give low-dose fluvoxamine, which is also used by itself. So you can use the two together, low-dose fluvoxamine, low-dose clomipramine, and prevent, that actually prevents the conversion of clomipramine to its metabolite. And that would be a very good thing. So not only are you enhancing the mechanism of action of serotonin for OCD, but you're actually also preventing the clomipramine from being converted to the less active metabolite. So that's taking advantage of a pharmacokinetic interaction rather than being scared of it. It can be helpful to you. Amoxapine is a metabolite of the conventional antipsychotic loxapine. So that may have some interesting properties as well, but it's important to realize that. Amoxapine is metabolized to a D2 antagonist and can cause EPS, but it might be useful for psychotic depression. You're getting a sort of built-in antipsychotic antidepressant thing going on there. But of course, you do have to potentially worry about that. Moving on. Doxepin appears to be the most highly antihistaminic, which is what we take advantage of with this, the insomnia. Uh, there's an FDA-approved low-dose version of doxepin, and we're probably taking advantage, at least partially, of the antihistamine properties, even at the lower doses. So these are doses lower than you would use to treat depression. 